Hello, everyone, and welcome to Audubon, South Carolina's Shorebird Steward Training. Uh, we thank you for being here and appreciate the time you're taking to help with the conservation of our shorebirds and seabirds in the state of South Carolina. We'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to first go a bit over the kind of layout of this training. We're going to start with some background information, and then we're going to move into the birds. Uh, so beach bird identification, our focal species, and then we'll end with the people. So human disturbance, stewarding do's and don'ts, and then how to volunteer with our program. So we'll start off with a little bit of background about the National Audubon Society. We work within the Northern and summer, Southern Hemisphere in North and South America. Um, and we base our work on the flyways of these birds. And so you can see the birds we're gonna be talking about today are shorebirds and seabirds are in the orange and green pathways. Um, but we, we organize our work based on the flyways of these birds, which makes a lot of sense because we work to preserve birds and the places they need today and into the future. And so our network, I mentioned we work in North and South America, but this graphic kind of shows the influence we have across the continental US. Um, and you guys, just by watching this training, are part of the web of conservation our conservation community that we have here in the United States. And so Audubon, South Carolina, as you can see all these different chapters, clubs, uh, state offices, Audubon, South Carolina is a state office of that National Audubon Society. And so Audubon, South Carolina is located within the Atlantic Flyway. And these numbers on the screen are specific to South Carolina. So we have about 187 miles of coastline nearly, nearly 3,000 tidal shorelines and about 35 barrier islands. Um, and so that is all great habitat for our shorebirds and seabirds to use while they're resting or nesting here in the state. Within National Audubon, we do have several different strategic priorities. So we don't just work along the coasts, we work within working lands, bird-friendly communities, bird-friendly forestry, climate, water. Um, but today we're gonna be focusing on our coastal priority. And that brings me to Audubon, South Carolina. Again, that state branch of the National Audubon Society. And within our coastal program of Audubon, South Carolina, our work focuses on the important breeding, stopover and wintering sites for birds uh, throughout the Atlantic Flyway. And so our work is organized mostly into people, places and policies. That's kind of the umbrella of what we put our work under. And so people like you guys watching this training today uh, you guys are the reason that this <clears throat> shorebird stewardship program exists and that this community is so successful in what we do. But we also work with a lot of different organizations. Uh, our big ones include U.S. Fish and Wildlife and South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. But we also work with several different other ones, uh, College of Charleston, South Carolina State Parks, the Charleston Animal Society, Coastal Expeditions, several others that you can see here on the screen and several others that aren't listed here on the screen. But without our partners, again, this organization wouldn't be so successful in our conservation work. Places, so we work all throughout the state of South Carolina. With our coastal work, we do focus our work along the coastline. Um, so this is a photo of Crab Bank within the Charleston Harbor before it was washed out by uh, Hurricane Irma a couple years ago. And uh, it is one really important barrier island that thousands of birds previously nested on. And thankfully that is one of our conservation successes this past year in 2021. Um, and hopefully in 2022 this year, we will get to see those birds return to Crab Bank and nest and raise their young. Other stewardship sites along the coast of South Carolina, again, Crab Bank is now a stewardship site, um, but we have sites, uh, the furthest north is in Murrells Inlet. Huntington Beach State Park. And then our furthest south is Bull Point down off of Pritchard's Island in Beaufort County, South Carolina. But we have sites all along the coastline. Um, and then we also work within the realm of policy. So within our policy work, we ensure a resilient coastline and state. We also work with other um, policy uh, components, but for the coast's purposes, we ensure resilient coastline and state. And just by being out on the beach and working to protect these shorebirds and seabirds and going through this training, you guys are advocates for these birds. Um, but if you would like to be more involved in the political policy realm, 
that we work with within Audubon, South Carolina, feel free to reach out to myself um, or any other Audubon staff member and we can get you going on that kind of work. But that brings me to why we even need shorebird stewardship in the first place. And so this is one of our shorebird steward volunteers um, out at one of our lighthouse inlet stewardship sites. Um, but why do we need shorebird stewardship in the first place? So worldwide coastal birds are declining significantly for various reasons, most of them being due to human influence. Um, migratory shorebirds, they migrate um, throughout the hemisphere and all of their Stopover breeding sites, wintering sites are being affected by humans. And so their populations are declining. The wintering shorebirds that we see here in South Carolina and throughout the hemisphere um, are declining for very similar reasons. And finally, the nesting sites of our shorebirds and seabirds are becoming more and more limited as coastal development grows along not only the coast of South Carolina, but along the Atlantic Flyway. Um, so this picture is actually a photograph of least terns nesting on a gravel rooftop, which is a form of adaptation that they have for losing their natural beach habitat nesting sites. So uh, while all of their habitat is under threat, their populations are declining because of that. And so we have implemented a shorebird stewardship program to help um, conserve these shorebirds and seabirds whose populations are in trouble. And so uh, what is it? What does it mean to be a shorebird steward? And it can sound kind of intimidating because you look at all these birds that we have on along our coast. Uh, most people think we just have laughing gulls on our beach, but we have so many more birds along our coastline. But to be a shorebird steward, you do not have to be a shorebird expert. So I don't expect you guys to name every bird that you see here in this picture by any means. I do encourage folks to learn more about shorebirds and seabirds because they are incredible creatures. But to be a shorebird steward, um, it is very simple. So the foundation of our work is preventing human disturbance to resting and nesting shorebirds through education and awareness. And so that's the foundation of our work and anyone can learn enough to be a shorebird steward. And this program uh, was started back in 2016 with just three sites along our coastline. And as you can see from this timeline, uh, we've increased not only our site number, but our number of volunteers who are actively working to protect our shorebirds. Uh, and of course, 2020 was a little bit of a different year, but we did have some folks who were residents who continued to walk on the beaches and try to help protect as much as they could around the pandemic and around those quarantine guidelines. But um, we bounced back in 2021 last year with an additional site and the most volunteers that we've seen since the inception of this program back in 2016. So with your help and your support, we can continue to grow into 2022 this season and uh, throughout the coming years. So while this is a pre-recorded presentation, you can obviously pause at any time, but I do like to include little break times. So now the next part of our presentation is going to be talking about beach bird identification. So feel free to pause this presentation now, take a little break. Um, but here on the screen, we do have some cool graphics of several of our different shorebirds and seabirds. And I've listed them out at the top of the screen, but I just thought they were cute little graphics to share with you guys. And so now we'll move on to beach bird identification. And no matter your level of birding expertise here in the state of South Carolina, or if you've had expert or had um, experience in different states, I do like to go over some of the basics so that when you are educating folks out on the beach, you can kind of remember to take a step back because not everyone really knows the difference between the different coastal birds that they're seeing on our beaches. So while we may see some wading birds like egrets and herons, we're mostly gonna be seeing shorebirds and seabirds along our beaches here in South Carolina. And so we do differentiate between the two. So I'll keep uh, using both of them throughout the presentation, but shorebirds, essentially the main difference between these two are what they eat and how they nest. Um, shorebirds will forage for food along the shoreline, looking for crabs, crustaceans, worms, insects, things like that. Whereas seabirds get their food from the sea. Uh, they go for fish. And as you can see, they, some, they will sometimes dive in the water like this least turn here on the screen. Uh, black skimmers will more so skim the water. Um, so that is how 
their different diets are comprised, but they also differ in how they nest. So our shorebirds are more of our solitary nesters and they start a little bit earlier in the season around March and they will uh, raise their young until about August. Whereas seabirds are colonial nesters and they start nesting around April and they will also go through August. Um, but solitary nesters, meaning shorebirds typically will nest alone. Uh, sometimes in an area you might see a couple different shorebirds, but nowhere near the huge colonial nesting habits of our seabirds where they will nest in big groups anywhere between, you know, 50s to hundreds of birds all in one area. Um, so shorebirds are also cryptic nesters, so they can be really tough to see when they're nesting in an area because they are solitary. So you may not know that they even have a nest there unless they display some uh, some behaviors that we'll talk about later, whereas seabirds are kind of more apparent. You'll, you'll know when you'll come across a seabird nesting area, there's just so many birds all in one area. And so I like to talk about kind of the different seasons we have for birds that we will see on our beach. And while we will see shorebirds and seabirds all year round here in South Carolina, we kind of differentiate between the two for the purposes of this training as migratory versus nesting seabirds and shorebirds. So the migratory birds that we have here in the state that we will see um, have often traveled thousands of miles uh, before they arrive here on this beach. So depending on the time of year, in the springtime, they will come up from their wintering grounds, either in the southeastern U.S., more like Florida, Texas, or even further south, uh, Central and South America. Um, so while they're here on our beaches, is it, ex it is extremely important for them to be nest or resting and refueling. So while they're on our beaches, they are going to be differing their behaviors based on the tide. At low tide, these birds are going to be foraging along the shoreline uh, because remember they are finding their food along the shoreline. Whereas at high tide, they're going to be up above that waterline um, resting. And so these pictures are of sanderlings. And so you can kind of see, it, usually they'll roost in bigger flocks. Sometimes they'll be a little more solitary depending on the bird, but that is their behavior based on the tide. Um, and then while they're foraging, different birds will go for different food. So even though you may see a large flock in one area, um, they will be looking for all different kinds of food along the shoreline. So. Not all of these birds in this graphic we will see here in South Carolina, some of them we will, but it's a great demonstrative graphic. Um, the longer build shorebirds that we'll see on our beach are going for things deeper in the sand. Uh, so some shrimps, maybe some marine worms, whereas the, the birds with the shorter bills are kind of gleaning uh, nutrients and looking for food along the very top surface or maybe just below the surface of the sand. And so kind of the best way I like to remember the difference between two of our, what can be very confusing shorebirds are plovers are gonna have the short, more stout bills. So plovers, whereas sandpiper species are gonna have a little bit longer of a bill. So plover and piper, that's kind of the way I like to remember it. Um, but again, based on their bill length is what they're gonna be going for. Um, so, with that, we'll move on to some of our nesting shorebirds that we'll see here in South Carolina. But I do like to mention, because a lot of people don't realize this, um, not only are our shorebirds and seabirds um, different in a lot of ways from other forest birds, but their nests are very different from what we think of as a bird's nest. Uh, so really what they're doing, as you can see in this picture, is making a little scrape in the sand and they will put their eggs right in that scrape. And in this photo, you can see the bird kind of put little pieces of shell around the nest to kind of decorate it. That doesn't always happen, but this is a typical shorebird nest. And so um, that is what you may or may not see. Typically, we're not gonna be able to get close enough to see these nests, maybe if you have high power scope or a high power camera, you'll be able to see it. But if you're getting this close without supervision of a trained biologist, you're way too close to this nest. Um, and this photo I took with a trained biologist. But our migratory birds that we just mentioned, I do want to talk about where they nest. So a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the birds we see on our beach 
when they're migrating through South Carolina, they're resting, they're refueling, they're getting that energy that they need because they are traveling such long distances. And you can kind of see in this graphic, they're flying up to the Arctic Circle, um, not necessarily Arctic Circle, but high in the Arctic, um, Northern Canada, sometimes Southern Canada, um, in some parts of the Northern United States. But it's pretty cool to talk to people about, hey, you see this shorebird now, but tomorrow they may be up in the Arctic. Uh, so the ones with the red uh, stars next to them are ones that we see here in South Carolina that migrate through our area. So we got Western sandpipers, different types of uh, plovers, the black belly plover, semi-palmated plover, ruddy turnstones, dunlin are pretty popular around here, different sandpipers, um, sanderlings are also very abundant here. And then of course we have our federally endangered red knot, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. But in the state of South Carolina, we do have a couple of shorebirds and seabirds that do nest in our area. For the purposes of this training, we're gonna be focusing on our nesting shorebirds. Whereas nesting seabirds, remember they are more colonial nesters and they prefer more of the offshore barrier islands to nest and raise their young. Um, we do have one species of seabird that we'll talk more about, the least tern, that does nest in areas near our shorebirds. Uh, but our nesting shorebirds here in South Carolina include the American oyster catcher, Wilson's plover, Willet and the killdeer is not pictured here, but that is a type of shorebird that you might also see nesting on our beach. And I love this graphic because it kind of shows not only that we have shorebirds here in the state all throughout the year, but it kind of breaks down the, the times of year that you will see certain birds. So again, like I mentioned, spring migrators, they're coming up from their wintering grounds in South and Central America, Southeastern US sometimes. They're stopping over here before they're flying north to their Arctic breeding grounds. And then the breeding season will have different shorebirds that will stay here from around March to around August for their breeding season. And then they will migrate out back down to their wintering grounds. And as the breeding season is ending for our Arctic nesting shorebirds, they are migrating back through South Carolina down to their wintering grounds. And then sometimes we have some residents. Uh, so more of our wintering birds that we see for about nine months out of the year. Um, and those include piping plovers, some black-bellied plovers. Of course, we have pelicans, and that's technically a seabird, but that is a pretty beloved coastal bird here in South Carolina. And with that, we'll move on to the focal species of birds that we teach during our stewardship trainings. And the, we call them the important four. So we have the piping plover, red knot, least tern, and the Wilson's plover. So least tern and Wilson's plover are gonna be the nesting shorebirds that we have here in the state. The red knot is a migratory bird that stays here for about three months in the spring, and then again for three months in the fall before leaving for their breeding or wintering grounds. And then we have the piping plover, who is a little bit more of a resident. They are here about nine months out of the year. And so we chose these as our important four, not only because their populations are in a bit more trouble than some of the other shorebirds and seabirds that we see, but also because when we're connecting with folks on the beach, we may not have that much time to spend with them. So having a couple minutes with a couple important key facts about certain species um, is important to be able to connect these beachgoers with the birds that are on our beach. However, I do like to mention um, the umbrella effect, which is by focusing, while we're focusing on these important four species, we are protecting several other different types of shorebirds and seabirds that use the same habitat as these important four that we're gonna be going into talking about. Um, so I like to say, by protecting the few, we're protecting the many. Um, so we're gonna go more into the important four and we're gonna start with the piping plover. So the piping plover, like I mentioned, is one of our wintering shorebirds. So the majority of the time when you see them, they may not be in breeding plumage. So they're gonna be more of a dull grayish color, um, a light gray color. They can look very similar at times to the semi-palmated plover. Um, but if you look at them together, they do look very different. So. Uh, the piping plover is going to be a lighter gray color, whereas the semi-palmated plover is going to be a darker brownish color. Uh, but anyway, 
These piping plovers are a small plover, so plover, remember, the short beak. Um, they do breed in different parts of Canada, the Great Plains of the United States, Great Lakes, and then in some of our more northeastern states. Um, majority of the time, the birds that we have here in South Carolina are typically breeding in the Great Lakes region. And based on their breeding populations are how they are listed federally. So the Great Lakes breeding population, um, because it has declined so drastically in recent years, is designated as federally endangered. So the birds we see here are typically federally endangered, whereas some other breeding populations are federally threatened. So still very low populations, um, but it is great to be talking to people on the beach and get them to recognize how awesome it is that they might see this endangered bird. Um, so although we won't see them raising young here in South Carolina, I wanted to show pictures because if we don't see birds on the beach, sometimes they're, they may just not be hanging out on the beach. Pictures are also a great way to connect with folks, um, kind of tug at their heartstrings a little bit. So this is a piping clover with some chicks. On the left, it's uh, touching beaks with its little chick. And then on the right, it is shading its chicks from the sun. So that's kind of how they protect their young from the heat of the sun or maybe the wind, you know, whatever the case may be. So they have a really cool foraging technique, which you might see while you're out on the beach. Let's see if this video play. So you can kind of tell from that video, um, apologies for the wind noise in the background of that video, but piping plovers have this forging technique where they'll tremble their foot on the top of the sand like you saw in the video. And that helps um, either bring the worms to the surface or maybe helps them locate the worms. I think it's more of the fact that it's helping bring these invertebrates up to the surface so that the piping plover can pop down, pull out its food, and then keep trembling its foot, pop down, pull out its food. So that's a cool little foraging technique to talk about with people if you see that happening on the beach. Um, typically, these birds will look a little different depending on the time of year. So like I mentioned, in the winter here in South Carolina, they're gonna be a little bit duller of a gray color. Um, because they are not in their breeding plumage, but sometimes in the spring and maybe when they first come back in the fall, they might still be in that breeding plumage. And so that's going to be their darker black band across their chest and across their head. Um, but typically in their wintering plumage, they're this, um, like these photos in the bottom right hand corner, they're going to be a light gray color. And like I mentioned earlier, they look very similar to the semi-palmated plover, which in the bottom left hand of the screen, you can see a piping and a semi-palmated plover sitting next to each other, um, which makes it much more easy to distinguish between the two because the piping plover is a lot lighter of a gray and you can tell the semi-palmated is a darker brownish gray. Um, but when they're separated, it might be a little difficult to tell. However, I like to mention piping plovers are typically by themselves on the beach or maybe in a smaller group on the beach, whereas semi-palmated plovers I've typically seen in larger groups on the beach. So maybe 20 to 50 or so, or even more birds all in one area, whereas piping plovers um, are more isolated, more individualistic, I like to say. So some talking points, most of which I've already mentioned, but just some things to remember. Oops, skip that. Uh, just some things to remember when we're on the beach and feel free to take a screenshot of this, maybe write some stuff down. Um, you don't have to memorize anything. There won't be a test at the end, but it's great again to have these talking points, maybe some stories, some metaphors to share with uh, folks while you have them on the beach talking for maybe a handful of minutes. So the population that we see here in South Carolina are breeding typically in the Great Lakes, but they also breed from um, in April to July in the Atlantic and Great Plains region, like I mentioned. A lot of times if they are banded, if you happen to see a banded bird, you can tell where they're, they were, ugh, you can tell where they were banded based on the color of the bird. Um, 
So I mentioned that Great Lakes population is federally endangered because it was once about 800 breeding pairs um, and it's gone down in recent years to about 71 breeding pairs. So it declined drastically. Um, the Atlantic region and Canadian breeding regions are federally threatened because they have about 2000 breeding pairs, which is still not a lot, um, but they're federally threatened. So either way, these birds populations are in drastic decline, mostly due to people, dogs, predators, development, um, climate change. So differences in weather that they're not used to. Typically when they're on the beach, they're gonna be eating marine worms, um, fly larvae, different types of insects, beetles. Um, they'll go after different gastropods, crustaceans, mollusks, different invertebrates um, while they're along the beach looking for food. Um, <clears throat> after they are done breeding in the fall, they will migrate back down either to South Carolina or to their other wintering grounds in the Southeast US or in Texas, maybe even the Caribbean. Um, and they will spend about nine months out of the year there. Um, and we here in South Carolina, they stay here because we have particularly great foraging and roosting habitat for them. Um, and they do travel thousands of miles to their breeding site. So while they are here, uh, it's great to remember that not only is their, their population in drastic decline, but they are about to fly thousands of miles come, come springtime to go breed and raise their young. So if they don't have that time to refuel, they might not have a successful breeding season, which they desperately need. So we do like to include some cartoons here in our training presentation. It kind of is an artistic way to relate the message of shorebird and seabird conservation. So I'll read this cartoon. It says, we'll fly south along the coast and stop in the Charleston area for a few days to rest before moving on. Why Charleston? There is lots of fresh seafood, beautiful beaches, and a rich history. Besides, the last time we flew by there, I saw a sign for a great sounding place to rest. And there's a sign on the beach that says, let them rest, share the beach. So um, yeah, kind of, kind of a nice little cartoon that displays that we are trying our best here in South Carolina to conserve these species. And that brings us to our next important four, um, that is the migratory red knot. And so these red knot, they are migratory, like I mentioned. So they are gonna be here about three months out of the year give or take some stragglers that may stay a little bit longer um, or come a little bit earlier. Um, so the red knot, when they first arrive here in the spring, they may not have that red breeding plumage yet. So they can look like gray types of sandpipers. Um, but as we move forward in the spring season, they will get that red belly as they are about to migrate up to their Arctic nesting grounds. And then they'll be, they'll still have that red belly when they come back in the fall, but they'll start to lose it before they leave for their wintering grounds at the end of fall, so around October. So adult red knots can fly up to 19,000 miles during a migration every single year. And so they are starting off typically at one tip of the hemisphere in the early part of the year. And by the end of the year, they're going up to the other tip of the hemisphere and then all the way back down. So they winter down in South America, um, the most Southern point Tierra del Fuego down in Chile. And then they will migrate up along the coast of South America and they'll stop over here in South Carolina to rest before either flying up to another stopover point in Delaware Bay and then flying up to their breeding grounds. But recent nanotech evidence has actually shown that some red knots that stop here in South Carolina won't stop again before going to their breeding grounds. They'll fly directly to the Arctic as opposed to having another stopover in Delaware Bay. Uh, so incredible birds, they are flying. They have one of the longest migrations in the animal kingdom. So while they are here, it is so, so important for us to allow them to rest and refuel because for these birds and for other migratory shorebirds and seabirds, it is life or death for them to be able to rest or refuel, rest and refuel. Uh, so I mentioned they will breed in the high Arctic and they will winter in South America. And so these are some of the routes that some of the birds that have had tags have taken on here on the map. And then on the right hand side are photos of some breeding retina. And so they are a shorebird. So again, they are cryptic nesters. 
And so it is very difficult to see these nests, as you can tell from these photos, but these birds will breed in the high Arctic. And then while they're here on our beach, this is what you'll see a lot of times, um, just these huge flocks of birds. Um, sometimes they may not be in thousands of individuals in a flock. Sometimes you might see a couple hundred, um, but typically they do hang out in huge flocks on our beaches. Um, and so we do have several different people within the state that will recite these red knots because some of them are banded. And so that data is important to contribute to the overall community to be able to know where these birds are going and what they're doing. Um, these birds are really cool because they also time their migration with the breeding season of the horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crab eggs are full of nutrients, full of protein. And so these birds will time their migration with when the horseshoe crabs are gonna be coming up to spawn along our shorelines. And so in recent years, we've noticed that anecdotal evidence has shown that horseshoe crabs um, are in decline in the state or we're losing numbers. They're just not breeding as much um, for various different reasons. And um, we're on high alert because that can have a huge effect on the population of these red knot. So um, if they're losing out on this essential food source that they use to be able to fuel their bodies to migrate the thousands of miles to their breeding ground, um, again, that can be life or death. So if they're not fattening up, if they're not resting before they fly again for another thousands of miles, um, they can die either in flight or have a very poor nesting season, which can contribute to even more of a population decline. And so here in South Carolina, um, I'll go over some of these breeding points. We have several because these are some really cool birds, but their population, I keep mentioning, has declined um, drastically in the last 20 years, about 70%. They do have, again, one of the longest migrations in the animal kingdom. Uh, one banded red knot was about 13, after about 13 years, had flown the distance from the earth to the moon and halfway back. So that kind of puts into perspective the distance that they are going, um, which is just crazy to think about and how incredible it is to be able to see these birds on our beaches, like in our own backyards. Um, so it's important for us to protect them as they are here for an average of 84 days to rest and refuel. And when they get here, they have already flown thousands of miles. So while they're here, again, we are trying to encourage folks to walk around their huge flocks don't run through them. Don't let your dogs or children run through them because them flying up out of the air, and we'll talk about this later, but that uses energy that they can be saving for their long migrations. Um, I mentioned they will be a brownish gray color when they arrive in the spring, and then they'll slowly start to get that beautiful red colored plumage on their bellies. Um, a lot of times people say they look like little sewing machines going along the shoreline feeding on either horseshoe crab eggs, like I mentioned, but they will also feed on coquina clams. So those are the clams that kind of make those little bubbles in the sand that we see along our beach. Um, so while they're here, they are building up that fat by eating those clams and those horseshoe crab eggs, and they are resting on our beaches. So while we may see them in, in different parts of the state, we do have two main staging areas for these red knot, which is essentially an area where these huge flocks will all hang out um, and they will rest and refuel as one big group. And so last year there was a reported 8,000 um, individuals in one flock at Seabrook Island. And so two of the most important staging areas in our state are Kiowa and Seabrook Islands in the Charleston area. They're separated by um, a little inlet of water, Captain Sam's Inlet. And so the huge flocks of birds will kind of bounce around depending on the tide um, to either rest and refuel um, either on Kiowa or Seabrook. And then our other important staging area is down in Beaufort on between Harbor and Hunting Islands, which is a similar kind of setup. They have a little creek that separates the two islands. And so those huge flocks will bounce between those two islands to rest and refuel. So the cartoon for the red knot, I've logged 6,000 miles with another 4,000 to go. I'm famished, says the little red knot. Um, 
then the pel and then the pelican gives him a really small plate of horseshoe crab eggs and the red knot says what's this i thought it was all you can eat and the pelican says it is and you'd better hurry up because that's about all you'll be able to eat and so the hort the red knot is eating the few little horseshoe crab eggs that he has and then they're getting chased off the beach by humans in this cartoon um, which is the sad reality so these red knot are uh, losing some of their important food source, the horseshoe crab eggs, but they're also losing their ability to rest while they're on our beach because of human disturbance. And so that brings us to our next of the important four. Our first nesting shorebird or seabird that we're gonna talk about is the least tern. So the least tern is one of our nesting birds here in South Carolina. And I mentioned it is a type of seabird. So it is a colonial nester. Uh, they get started a little later in the nesting season in April, where shorebirds are in March. Um, but they are nesting typically in similar areas as to where our shorebirds are nesting. So we do prefer to include it in our important four because they are designated as the highest priority in our South Carolina Wildlife Action Plan. And that's the same for the Wilson's Plover. And then those other two we just talked about, the red knot, that's a federally endangered species, and the piping plover that we see here in South Carolina are also federally endangered. Um, so these populations are declining drastically, again, just like our other birds that we've talked about. Um, but least turn out really cool. They have this incredible, incredibly distinct courtship behavior. So the male least turn will go to the sea because that's where they get their food is because they're a seabird. Um, they will grab what they think is the best fish and they'll go and they'll take that fish in its beak and they'll wiggle it in front of the female. And so that female will decide whether or not they want to mate with that male. And in this instance, uh, she said no. So sometimes they will be successful and the, the female will say, yes, this is a great fish, let's mate. And so they have, you can see a lot of times in the early spring, um, in April, a lot of these terns are going to be doing this, so it's pretty cool to watch. Um, that's kind of their mating ritual. And then what you'll see here on our beaches in South Carolina as they are nesting, a lot of times you will see things like this. So in the bottom corner, we do have a picture of some of the symbolic fencing that we um, help to put up with the direction of U.S. Fish and Wildlife and South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, who are in charge of um, locating the areas where the birds will nest and putting up this signage that says area closed, do not enter. Sometimes we'll put string along the edge so folks know do not cross this area because birds are nesting here. Um, most of the time we do take the signs and we put them in in the spring and we'll take them out in the fall after breeding season is over. Sometimes you might see them on the beach year round, uh, but typically they are removed and they're not permanent. So that's why we call it symbolic fencing. Um, so some other things you'll see with least turns on the beach. I mentioned that um, distinct courtship behavior. They will copulate on the beach just like this. Um, you might see some get lucky and see some chicks uh, out in your area with the help of a scope or some binoculars. Um, they look like little cotton balls with toothpick legs and uh, they're, they're just really cute birds. And so if you don't see chicks on the beach, but it is nesting season and you wanna to talk to folks about how cool these birds are, it can be great to have a picture on hand of a least turn chick um, because that kind of tugs at people's heartstrings and gets them to care a little bit more about these birds. Um, and so they are seabirds, like I've mentioned. So juveniles, once they have hatched, are dependent on their parents to feed them. And so the parents will go to the ocean, grab them some fish, bring them back. Um, but least terns here in the state, unfortunately, mostly nest on gravel rooftops. Uh, and that's as, as of recent data. So unfortunately, as they're nesting on gravel rooftops, that can be a huge issue, not only because are the rooftops much hotter than the beach may be because sometimes they have that black mat underneath the gravel. Sometimes they have HVAC systems that make it hotter, um, but also chicks can fall off the roof. And then sometimes the roof may be further from the ocean. And so it may make it difficult for the parents to bring those fish back for the chicks to eat. 
Um, so every beach nesting site where you see least terns nesting is extremely, extremely important. Uh, they're losing a lot of great habitat due to coastal development and human disturbance. So anytime we're able to get them to nest on an actual beach habitat, it is extremely important that we as stewards protect them while they are raising their young. So some talking points, a lot of these I've already mentioned. Um, they've declined drastically in South Carolina since the 1980s, about 30% based on um, breeding data. Uh, they mostly nest on gravel rooftops here in the state, which is a big reason why they are designated as the highest priority in our wildlife action plan. They have that really cool courting behavior with the little fish waggle. Um, and then these birds are actually very defensive of their nests. And so that's a little different than shorebirds that we see here in the state as they're defending their nests. These least terns you'll know when you get too close to a nest. Um, they are a colony nester, so not only will you see them and hear them as they're nesting, but they can also dive bomb any predator that they see is a threat to their chicks and their eggs. So if humans get too close to their nesting area, they will dive bomb at you. Um, last summer I was pooped at, so that's another great way to tell people, hey, you don't wanna get pooped on, don't get so close to the nesting area. Um, that's just a great way to communicate with folks. Uh, these birds, kind of like I mentioned, other shorebirds and seabirds, their nests are different. They are shallow scrapes in the sand. And then their eggs, they're going to be incubated by both the male and female least turn for about 20 to 25 days. And the biggest threat to the eggs while they're trying to be incubated by the parents is that if a predator or anything they perceive as a predator. So humans, dogs, kites, anything like that. Um, if they get too close to the nest, the adults will fly off the nest to defend them. Um, and so that leaves the eggs and the chicks exposed to the really hot sun, uh, which can be very dangerous and can kill them in a matter of minutes, unfortunately. The cartoon for the least turn. Okay, everyone, memory time, smile for the camera. Oh, dad, what do you need pictures for? We migrate to the same beach every year because memories last longer than nesting sites. And that is um, a sign that says condos coming to Ocean Beach 2018. So again, the sad reality, they are losing their nesting sites because of coastal development. And those sites that they are able to have on the beach are under threat for uh, by human disturbance. Um, so very important for us to protect them as they are nesting on our beach. And finally, that brings us to the last of the important four, the Wilson's Plover, another nesting shorebird here in South Carolina. Um, Wilson's Plover are really cool birds. They are shorebirds, like I mentioned. So they are cryptic nesters. They are solitary nesters. Um, cryptic nesters essentially means their nests are very, very well camouflaged. Uh, within the sand, which can be very dangerous if people aren't paying attention to that symbolic fencing that I mentioned, because these eggs and these chicks are very difficult to see as you're just strolling along the beach, as you can tell from these photos. So um, that helps hide them from predators, but it does make them very susceptible to humans and anything humans are doing on the beach. So like I mentioned with least turn, they're very defensive. They will dive bomb you if you're too close. Whereas different plover species, and that does include the Wilson's plover, when predators get too close, they do this broken wing display. And I will show you what that kind of looks like. So you can tell from this video, plovers that are trying to distract predators away from their nests and chicks are gonna do this broken wing display. So they make it look like to predators that they, the adult bird is injured. And so they will lead the predator away from the nest, whether it be a human, like in this video, this, this person filming was way too close to this piping plover, um, which clearly had nests or chicks in the area because it was displaying broken wing. Um, but the adults will pretend to be hurt, lead the predator away from the nests or chicks, and then it will fly off because it's not actually hurt. It's just their defense mechanism. Um, so if you see this or stumble upon this, it means you're way too close to a nest or chicks 
Sometimes it can happen by accident, especially if you are a trained biologist and you just kind of stumble upon um, a bird that you may not know was previously there as you're putting up fencing. Um, but yeah, that is their defense mechanism, a broken wing display. Several different plovers do it. I've seen a killdeer do it. Wilson's plover will do it, um, clearly a piping plover. Um, so if you get too close, that's what they will be doing. They are not injured. That's just their way of saving their eggs and chicks from a predator. While they are nesting here in South Carolina, Wilson's plover, a lot of times, this is what you'll see on the beach. So these birds are brown and white. Um, the females and the males do look a little bit different. Uh, the males will have a darker black neck band, whereas the females have a lighter brown neck band. Um, so those are the only shorebirds that I know of that I can tell the difference between male and female. But both birds will incubate the eggs. Um, they will help teach their young to feed quite um, quickly after they hatch. So it's really cool, these birds, you'll see the male and the female a lot of times, but you won't always see the chicks because they are cotton balls on toothpick legs and they blend in very well to the sand. But as soon as they hatch, these birds are able to walk around. And so the parent birds will teach their babies how to eat almost immediately. Because unlike the least turn chicks that are trying to get their food from the sea because they are seabirds, these shorebirds are able to forage for their food along the shoreline. So the babies, although they can't fly yet, are able to walk to go look for food. And so the parent Wilson's plovers will teach them how to look for fiddler crab, which is their favorite type of food, as well as other different invertebrates along the um, marsh line or in the shoreline. And so here's several different pictures of Wilson's plovers in the state. These can also be banded, um, which you can report at bandedbirds.org. Um, a lot of times they are included on pictures of these area closed signs within the bird nesting areas with our symbolic fencing. Um, and so they are solitary nesters. Uh, you may not see a bunch in one area, but you may see you know, three or four on a beach in an area. Um, and the biggest threat is human disturbance, like we'll talk about again here in a minute. But um, as that broken wing display, if they're trying to distract predators away, that does take the parents away from incubating the eggs or shading the chicks. And so that can be very dangerous for the eggs and chicks. Like I mentioned with the least terns, uh, they can cook in a matter of minutes. So some talking points for the Wilson's plover. As of 2012, the last census in the state for Wilson's plover, they had about 375 nesting pairs. Um, although I don't like to tell folks this, they are most likely to tolerate disturbance. Um, their populations are declining because of a loss of habitat and human disturbance. They're seen alone or in pairs and they stand very tall. So the way I kind of tell a Wilson's plover uh, apart from semi-palmated or piping plovers, not only are they, are they a little bit bigger in size, but they stand very tall in that posture. Um, and so I say Wilson has a great posture because especially when they're trying to look out for predators, you'll see either the male or the female on a little piece of sand, just kind of looking out with the, their chest out and their head held high looking for predators. Um, and these chicks will feed themselves. Like I mentioned, they'll fly in about 21 days and disturbance can cause those, those adults to leave the nest and the eggs can cook as a result. So just a few talking points for Wilson's Plover. Um, the cartoon for these guys, what are you doing, Ralph? I'm practicing my broken wing display to lure predators away from our nest. Now, doesn't that look silly? How about this? Sure, if you stubbed a toe, Hush, Ralph, I think I hear something. And then it's some humans with some binoculars. And I say, oh, that poor Wilson's plover, what's wrong with him? I'm not sure, but I think he might be constipated. And so kind of goes to show, most folks think the bird is hurt or somehow injured. But again, that broken wing display is a defense mechanism. So kind of how I mentioned before with the umbrella effect, um, while we talked about these four focal species, um, we do 
also protect indirectly these other birds that we may not be talking in detail about today. I do encourage you to learn more about them though. Um, so at risk of becoming threatened in the state of South Carolina, we have the black skimmer, the American oyster catcher and willet. Um, and to put it into perspective, last summer, we only had one colony of successful black skimmers um, whereas in past years, we had a handful of successful black, uh, black skimmer colonies and Georgia did not have any successful black skimmers. So it goes to show how important it is to protect these birds um, while they're breeding in our state. Um, and then of course, declining populations of migrating and wintering species. We have sanderling, wimbrel and ruddy turnstone that all hang out on our beaches as they're migrating. Uh, Wimbrel, if you haven't seen Discovery at DeVoe about the um, new information coming out about how almost half of the Atlantic Wimbrel population hang out on DeVoe Bank at night to rest. Um, it's an incredible 10 minute documentary. Um, I highly encourage you to look for it and watch it if you haven't seen it already. But it just puts into perspective um, highlighting a different seabird species that we have here in South Carolina, seabird shorebird species that we have here in South Carolina that are in our own backyard that are just incredible birds, but who we are losing very quickly. And so with that, if you'd like to pause for a quick break, we are going to go to um, talking more about people and human disturbance here in a minute. I did have some trivia questions up uh, if you want to pause and think about it, but the answers to these, we have about 50 uh, species of shorebirds that nest in North America. Semi-palmated means they have partially webbed toes. So semi-palmated plovers, partially webbed toes. And then these three lookalike species, we have the least sandpiper, which is the smaller of the sandpipers that we have here, the Western and the semi-palmated sandpiper, which are very difficult to tell apart, um, but we have all three species. We see them all here in South Carolina. Um, and so with that, we'll move on to people. I can switch this up. All right. So we'll first talk a little bit about human disturbance and why that is such a challenge for shorebirds and seabirds. So the endangered beach ecosystem, which is a sad reality. Um, we do have some natural disturbances to our birds, but as this cartoon is gonna show, it's a couple American oyster catchers starting to nest. On Monday, they start laying, their, they start making their nest. Tuesday, Wednesday, they're starting to lay those eggs. By Friday, they have three eggs, they're very happy. Saturday comes along, which as most of you may know, watching this training, summertime on the weekend can be very busy on the beach. These oyster catchers look up, see a huge crowd of folks running by. They say, uh-oh, they have to leave the nest because they are now endangered. And of course that leaves the eggs. And if the eggs have hatched, the chicks leaves them behind um, and puts them at risk of death. So uh, sad reality, but these conservation challenges, uh, we'll talk mostly about recreational and human disturbance, but I do wanna to touch on some of the more natural challenges that we can't necessarily affect while we're out on the beach. Um, so they face several different conservation, more natural conservation challenges, predation, climate change, sea level rise, um, avian disease, severe cold weather, severe fluctuations in weather, um, that reduced prey base. So horseshoe crab eggs, like I mentioned with the red knot, declining. And then of course, storm and tidal surge is a big one as well. Um, so I'll touch on climate change. We all know um, does happen naturally, but it is exacerbated by humans. And so although we do recognize that as a threat to shorebirds and seabirds, it is more of a collective action that is going to help change that. But it's not something we can change with a five minute conversation on the beach. Um, so we won't be focusing on that so much here in this presentation, but it is one of the natural threats. Uh, this is actually a pier at Myrtle Beach in 2018. And so unfortunately, hurricane season does coincide with the nesting season for these shorebirds and seabirds. So storm and tidal surge is a huge issue for some of these birds um, as they're nesting. And then of course, 
As we know here in South Carolina, our tides fluctuate severely between high and low tide. Uh, typically these birds are gonna be nesting above the high tide line. And so that keeps them safe most of the time. But if we have a big storm that can put their eggs and chicks at risk uh, because that storm water can come up into their nesting area. So we also have predators for these birds, raccoons, laughing gulls, uh, crows are a big one, owls. We have owls that will try to predate um, ghost crabs. I've seen a lot of times go after the eggs. Uh, different snakes, coyotes are another big one, um, different hawks, foxes, and then of course humans, you know, we don't predate them, but we can step on them. And then that's something that deer might, might do as well, step on the eggs. Um, so these birds have several different conservation challenges. They're under threat from a lot of different, more natural things that we can't control. But the greatest conservation challenge by far is recreational disturbance or human disturbance. I'll kind of use those interchangeably. But so what does that mean? So human disturbance, recreational disturbance, um, as you can see in these pictures, the one on the left is Myrtle Beach. The one on the right is Folly Beach. During the summer, huge crowds come to the beach to hang out. Um, and like in that movie, The Field of Dreams, if you've seen it, great movie. If you build it, they will come. And so as we're developing along the coastline, folks are coming more and more to the coast to either live or visit. Um, but if we build it, they will come and they will go. So our, our natural wildlife that makes South Carolina so beautiful is under extreme threat. Not only our birds, like we've been talking about during this presentation, but horseshoe crabs, like I mentioned, sea turtles, and then our natural beach vegetation might get stepped on, trampled on people running on the dunes. Um, so a lot of threats because of human disturbance. And recent studies have actually found that while we were anecdotally able to say recreational disturbance was a big threat, um, the Atlantic Flyway Disturbance Project was able to say definitively through a literature review that human disturbance um, is a major issue to shorebirds' lives. lives. Um, so they had about 632 different citations referencing human disturbance. Um, so a couple of key findings. This is a long-term project, so it is still um, occurring here in South Carolina. We're in phase three, so hopefully next year we'll have some more data for you. Um, but essentially, two major key findings from this literature review and the years of this project that has been occurring. Results indicate that shorebirds were impacted by human recreational disturbance throughout their annual life cycles. And across all species included in this assessment, human disturbance negatively affects shorebirds. And so, like I said, this is a multi-year project. It's occurring all throughout the Atlantic Flyway, so all the way from Maine down to Florida. Um, it is a long-term study, so uh, once that gets published, I think parts of it are already published. It's a great way to learn more about human disturbance and its uh, huge effect on our shorebirds and seabirds. So I keep saying human disturbance, but what does that mean? So basically anything we do for fun on the beach, uh, running, biking, boating, um, sometimes driving in different parts of uh, the state. There might be golf carts that are allowed on the beach, ATVs, um, walking our dogs, flying kites. Um, and then a lot of times I remember as a kid, chasing birds was a fun thing. So disturbance is the silent killer for not only our nesting birds that we've talked about, but also the migrating birds and the wintering birds that we have here in South Carolina. And so changing the way in which we recreate um, and where and when we do it can make a huge difference. And so that's kind of what we're doing on the beach, which brings me to stewarding. And so we talked a little bit about at the beginning why we need stewardship and kind of basically what stewardship is, that educating humans about human disturbance and protecting our shorebirds and seabirds through education and awareness. But what is it exactly? So this is a photo from one of our sites out at Seabrook Island. Um, shorebird volunteers, shorebird steward volunteers are the boots on the ground that our shorebirds need 
to uh, be able to educate beachgoers about our vulnerable birds. So the number one job of all stewards is to educate and inspire. And the kind of foundational quote that I, I like to remember for this work is conservation begins with human awareness. So without folks being aware of these incredible birds and their different life cycles and journeys, um, they're not going to care and they're not going to want to protect them because they just don't know that they're there. So what we do with shorebird stewarding, um, essentially we're gonna be volunteering on the beach for a couple of hours, primarily on weekends, but some of our sites do have weekday shifts, um, especially during the holidays. So Memorial Day, July 4th, when we see many more people on the beach are gonna be important stewarding days. But these are some pretty typical stewarding setups. We have um, folks that like to bring scopes. We have some sites that have spotting scopes, which make it makes it a lot easier to see the tiny baby birds and the little eggs. Um, a lot of people bring their binoculars. Some people are photographers. They like to bring their cameras. But at different sites, we have a lot of the same materials. So you'll see this ask me about the bird sign that helps bring folks to you to chat about um, the birds. Um, and then well, some sites will have a beach cart. Uh, we have these awesome bookmarks that we like to give to folks. Um, and it has all of the shorebirds in order from biggest to smallest. And then on the back, it might be flipped around on the screen, but it says share the love, share the shore. And then it has Audubon's website where you can go to find some other educational resources, different volunteering opportunities. Um, but this is a typical stewarding setup. So while you're on the beach, this is, is this is what you will be doing. Um, talking to folks as they walk by. If you see someone um, disturbing the birds, um, going up to them, just chatting with them about why that's so detrimental to their life cycles. Um, and we do steward primarily in the summer. Um, that's when in the spring and summer, and then some sites will go into the fall. Um, we don't have a solid wintering shorebird stewarding program yet, but it would be great to get that going here in the next winter. But our seasons are based on the birds. And like I mentioned, summer holidays are a huge time to be out on the beach because we're gonna see so many more people that are getting close to our nesting birds. Um, and that is typically when the eggs have hatched, especially around July 4th and we have chicks on the beach. So it's important for folks to get out there and point out either the chicks or the nesting area so folks will stay as far away as possible. Um, but no matter what season you're stewarding, whatever season you're out on the beach talking to people, you're gonna see a lot of these same types of human disturbances. So I mentioned flushing birds. A lot of kids, sometimes dogs, uh, will enjoy chasing huge flocks of birds and scaring them off because they like to watch them fly away. Um, but with our nesting shorebirds, that can cause nest failure because it is exposing those eggs or those little chicks to the hot sun. And then with our migrating birds or our wintering birds that are here to rest and refuel, that causes huge energy losses, um, which they need for their very long migrations. So um, flushing birds is a huge issue, something to be on the lookout for while you're out there stewarding. Another one is dogs. So to birds, um, this is what a dog looks like. It doesn't matter how well behaved or cute or sweet your dog is. To a bird, all dogs look like predators. Um, so if on leash dogs, if your dog is on leash or someone else's dog is on leash, they can still get too close to the birds, especially to the nesting area, um, which will cause them to flush. But off leash dogs are also a huge issue because they can enter roped off areas. Um, which I like to use this really sad example. This is down in Florida. Um, you can see the little posts in the sand. This was a colony of least terns, I believe. And the colony had about 60 nests in the roped off space. Uh, two dogs got off leash by the owners. Um, I've read that it was a positive interaction. So a steward went up and talked to them, got the dogs back on a leash and they walked on a different part of the beach. So it was a positive interaction, but that colony of 60 nests went down to six nests in a matter of a 
two, three minutes, um, just from the dogs getting off leash and running through a nested, nesting area. So it's very, very important to, to encourage dog owners to, depending on the beach, some dogs are not allowed at all. Um, some beaches do require dogs to be on a leash. Um, even if they are allowed off leash, it's very, very important uh, while we see these huge flocks of birds migrating, or if we have nesting birds in the area during the summer, to leash the dogs and walk them on a different part of the beach to be able to avoid any kind of human disturbance to these birds. So that's a picture of the eggs. And there again, there are about 60 and the dogs caused them to go down to six. Um, another more prevalent concern that we're seeing in recent years are drones. So each site may have different drone policies. I know it's, um, they're not allowed at all at national parks, state parks uh, prohibit them a lot of times, or some sites require permits, um, and some sites may not have rules at all regarding drones. So it's very important, no matter which stewardship site you may want to volunteer at, understand what um, the drone may be. But no matter what, even if you don't know the rules for the drones, if you can encourage folks that may have drones that are flying low enough to disturb the birds, um, to encourage them to move down the beach to a different part where they will not be disturbing these birds and causing them to fly up off the nests. And uh, feel free to use this example, but last year in 2021 out in California, one drone that was being recreationally used crashed into an elegant tern colony and you can see in this picture, some of the eggs were um, broken by this crash itself, but just because the disturbance was there, it scared the entire colony and they left, um, they left all of these eggs. So there were about 1500 nests and about 3000 birds that just abandoned the entire nesting site. So that, that elegant turn colony completely failed that, that year. Um, so, it is essential to be able to encourage folks to move their drones down the beach. Um, and we'll talk about what if we run into a negative interaction, folks don't wanna to listen to that. Um, we'll talk about the best way to handle it, but um, moving drones down the beach, bottom line. And so some other common disturbances, of course here in South Carolina, we have a big, um, recreational water community. So lots of boaters, lots of kayakers. Those can be very big disturbances if they're parking to their boat too close to a nesting area or in an area where the birds are foraging. Um, kites are a big issue. They can look like bigger birds that are predators for these shorebirds and seabirds. Um, helicopters and airplanes and drones, like I mentioned, are a big one. Um, people walking through roped off areas so sometimes with big storms, some signage might get knocked down. So it's very important to not only report if signs do fall down, just let myself know, or if you know people at DNR or Fish and Wildlife, let them know. Um, because walking through a nested area can disturb the entire colony of maybe lease turns, or people can be stepping on those shorebird nests. Um, setting it up too close to a nesting area. So folks, Although with our symbolic fencing, when biologists are posting that fencing, they try to give the birds a bit of a buffer and put those, those posts signs um, a little further away from where they think the birds will nest. But birds are birds and they're not gonna listen to the signs that we put up on the beach. So they may nest a lot closer to the signage than we think or than we anticipate. So when folks set up too close to a nest, if there are nests really close to the posted signs, that puts them in danger of getting crushed. Or if they're setting up too close and they have a big umbrella like this, the birds can very easily disturb um, and then start flying off those nests, which leaves them exposed. Uh, and then finally, driving on the beach is a huge issue. So golf carts um, can easily crush little chicks that may be running between the nesting area and the shoreline to feed. Um, it can also, with migratory birds, it can cause them to flush the flock. Um, so that's another very common disturbance. So with those in mind, we'll go over some stewarding do's, um, some stewarding do's and some don'ts. So we'll talk about what the best way to do 
the best way to be a steward is and some things to keep in mind not to do. Um, so as I mentioned, we're here to educate and inspire. We're not here to uh, be a type of law enforcement. We're not here to write tickets. We're here to guide views of the beach birds, um, show folks pictures of the beach birds, to kind of get them to care, get them engaged, and then give people reasons to care about them. So that's why we go through those important four to have some details of why folks should be caring about these declining populations of shorebirds and seabirds. Um, being a good neighbor, so although we do in the area, a lot of times stewards do talk to residents of certain beaches. And so it's important to, hey, let's be a good neighbor. A lot of us are trying to protect these birds. Um, you can help us by um, walking around the flock or giving the nesting birds space between their nesting area. Um, while you're out on the beach, it is important to be able to tolerate the hot summer conditions that we have. Some sites require a little bit of walking, so being able to walk. Um, and then of course, having a friendly and positive attitude is a big one. Um, people, a lot of communication is nonverbal. So if people see that you might have a negative attitude or you might be a little bit grumpy or whatever the case may be, they're not gonna be as engaged or as open to hearing what you have to say. So very important to have a friendly and positive attitude while you're out on the beach. Um, some other things, it is a conversation. Again, we are here to educate and inspire. So we don't wanna be just lecturing people. Uh, we want to have them, we want to give them the ability to ask questions, to get engaged, to be curious. Um, so it's important to look for eye contact, um, look for curiosity, especially with kids. They're very curious, they'll ask a lot of questions. Um, when you're out there stewarding, don't feel like you have to talk to every single person that walks by you. Um, and that's where that eye contact comes in. A lot of times you'll be able to tell if someone just wants to be left alone or if they are open to a conversation. Um, if someone is disturbing the birds, it's important whether or not they want to talk to you to approach them and um, give them that information about why what they're doing can be detrimental to these birds. Um, it's important while you're out there to keep an eye on the birds. So if as you're talking to people, the birds move and move closer to you, maybe it's a good idea to move a little bit further away. Don't get too close to a nesting area if you're trying to show folks the birds. Um, and then uh, if, by showing folks the birds, you are giving them a chance to share that experience, which is a great way to be engaged. Um, ask, asking people to share the responsibility. So, hey, help us out. You can be a huge factor in the life or death of these birds um, just by walking around the flock. Um, and then while you're out there, remember you are representing Audubon all of our shorebird partners out at Fish and Wildlife and DNR, and then whichever site you're at, you're representing that community as well. So um, it's important to remember that because if folks have a negative interaction with us um, because of our behavior, it can put a negative view on the birds for those people in the future, um, which can, can cause an issue for these birds. And we are here ultimately to protect our shorebirds. So that brings me to a couple of stewarding don'ts. So like I mentioned, that friendly and positive attitude. We're not here to be mean. Um, we're not here to enforce the rules. We're here to educate folks about why the rules are in place or why the rules are implemented in the first place. Um, we're not here to disturb the birds. So we don't wanna get too close to them for any reason, whether or not we're a photographer trying to show people what the birds are doing. And then of course, like I mentioned at the very beginning, we are not here to be experts and anyone can learn enough to contribute. So as long as you're out here, you're already here listening to this training, you already know enough to be a shorebird steward. That's all it takes is a, a little bit of passion, a little bit of commitment to get out there and educate folks to care about our birds. So um, with that being said, while negative interactions are rare, uh, we had about 98% of our reported interactions last year were all positive. So a very small percentage of folks um, have negative interactions where people are either just aggressive or they just don't want to hear it or they're doing something to disturb the birds and they don't want to stop. So if that happens, um, 
again, we are not law enforcement. We're not here to write tickets. So we just have to say, all right, have a good day. And we have to back off because we don't want you all to get hurt. Um, and we don't want the birds to get hurt by um, instigating anything further with someone who may have uh, a negative attitude. So if that happens, you are going to call the security at whichever site you're at. Um, if need be, um, it is important to have your cell phone on you while you're stewarding. So if something does happen and there's an injury or another emergency that has nothing to do with stewarding, you're, you can call 911. Um, and then if that happens too, and you wanna talk about it, talk about the interaction itself and maybe how you can improve in the future or you know, address that situation in the future, um, feel free to come chat with me. Uh, we can talk about that. And then of course, unfortunately, we are still in the pandemic era and we want you guys to feel safe with, with COVID-19 precautions. If you do have binoculars in the scope and you don't want the public using it or sharing it, don't feel like you have to. Um, there is an option to print off pictures. Um, a lot of sites already have some pictures printed off. Um, so whatever you're comfortable with, if you feel more comfortable wearing a mask while you're out on the beach, feel free to do so. Um, if you feel like you wanna stand further back while talking to folks, do that too. We want you guys to be safe and feel comfortable while you're out on the beach. And so that brings me to a couple of pro tips uh, gathered from stewards who are, are veterans of our program. Um, starting with two positives can be a great way to engage folks. Uh, so starting off with, hey, how's everyone doing? If you're talking to a group of, or a family, um, are you enjoying the beach today? Are you visiting? Do you live here? Um, starting off with two positive things. Oh, today is great weather, right? Um, and then listening to them, a lot of times they will question why you're out there in the first place, especially if you're wearing like one of our um, safety vests that says shorebird steward. Um, we have signs, a lot of people will ask you about the birds when you put your ask me about the birds sign out. So it's important to listen to them, have a conversation, answer questions, um, and then making it normal to making it a social norm for folks to listen to what you're saying and do what you're saying, making it feel like it's part of the community. So um, for example, most people that come to this part of the beach will try to walk around the flock. Um, so just making it something that's a normal behavior and that way they are part of a group and part of the community and not the um, oddballs that are walking through the flock. A couple other ones, sincere interest and enjoyment. So just by listening to this training today, um, you're already at that point. Um, birds are protected under state and federal laws. So if someone is causing injury or damage to these birds, you can report it to DNR. Um, it is a violation and it is important sometimes to have analogies on hand. So one of the ones I like to use is, um, especially with kids, even with adults, you know, think about the longest trip you've ever taken, whether it be a transatlantic flight, whether it be driving up and down the coast, whatever the case may be. Um, when you get home and all you want to do is kind of lay out on the couch, rest, relax, have a good home cooked meal. Um, so just thinking about that when we have migratory birds that they finally make it to South Carolina's beach, it's kind of like their second home. They get here, they just want to rest and relax. Um, if they're not able to do that, it can be life or death for them, whereas to us, it's more of an annoyance if we're unable to do so. Um, another good one, if you're super hungry, imagine if you're super hungry and you get to the food court, and you sit down, you're about to take a bite of your sandwich and someone pulls a fire alarm. Um, and so you have to leave the building, you're not able to eat. That's a lot of times what birds that get chased by folks or, um, or who are flushing the flock, that's what they feel like. They feel like the fire alarm is getting pulled on them. Um, and then finally, we are in South Carolina. So uh, one of our stewards, Ranger Mike, he likes to encourage Southern hospitality. So, hey, how's it going y'all? Uh, welcome to South Carolina's beach, um, wherever you're at on the beach. Um, just kind of being really polite, really engaged, kind of what Southern folks get uh, the reputation for. And then of course, here, this picture is a great example of great ways to interact with 
um, dog parents, speaking as a dog parent, if you love on the dog, uh, people are going to be more open to listening to you. So if dog owners are on the beach and whatever the rules may be for your particular beach, it's best to approach um, the folks with the dog and say, hey, your dog, you know, is you have a cute dog. What's its name? Oh, he's so well behaved if he's well behaved. Um, and just giving him a chance to show that you don't hate dogs. We're not here to, to shame you for having a dog. We're just here to encourage you to take your dog to a different part of the beach. Um, and some sites will write tickets for dogs on the beach. So that can be a good thing to mention to folks. Um, you're here to help them avoid a ticket and explain why they can't have their dog on the beach in the first place. So while you're out there stewarding, it is very important to be prepared. So you wanna bring a lot of water because it can get hot out on the beach. Um, plenty of sunscreen, a hat to protect your face, sunglasses, um, snacks. So our site, depending on which site you're at, the shift times will vary between two to four hours. So if you wanna bring a snack, um, bring your cell phone, like I mentioned, to have on hand to either report violations or report an emergency if need be. Um, many sites have the vest so that you see in the picture, so you'll be able to wear that so people will recognize you as a volunteer and not just a random person talking to people on the beach. Um, make sure to bring your binoculars if you have a scope, if you want to take some photos with your big fancy wildlife photo photography equipment, um, feel free to bring that. And then if you want a chair to sit in while you're stewarding, feel free to bring that. Some people like beach umbrellas whatever you need to make you feel comfortable while you're out there on the beach. Um, make sure you bring that. And so at each site, uh, there are some contacts to have on hand. Um, obviously, emergency, uh, call 911. You'll get my number after you receive an email from me. Um, South Carolina Department of Natural Resources game thief number. So if someone is disturbing these birds and is not listening, uh, you can call this number to report them. Um, and then at different sites, you'll have different site leaders and different site security instances. So depending on where you're going, it's important to have those numbers on hand in case you need them. And with that, we'll get into how to sign up to be a volunteer with Audubon South Carolina and some of the incentives we're going to have this year. So to get started, uh, first, first step, watch this training. Um, check. Good job, guys. Second step on this webpage where you found this training, you'll see liability forms. We have one for adults over 18 and then for minors under 18. Feel free to bring uh, your family, friends out on the beach with you um, to steward. Some, some sites will only allow a certain number of stewards. So it does depend on where you're going, but um, whoever you bring on the beach, it's important to have that liability form filled out. You just need to fill out one per year and all returning stewards also need to fill it out. Um, and so for underage, yep. So then after you fill out your liability form, you'll get a confirmation email with a link that will take you to our website where we have all of our shift times and different uh, stewardship sites listed out. And you can sign up for as many or as few as you would like. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about more about that process in just a second. So pick your shifts invite your friends, um, and then of course, have fun. That's the biggest thing. We want you guys to enjoy what you're doing because that's gonna shine through as you're talking to folks on the beach. And then finally, uh, after you serve your shift, you're gonna wanna fill out your post shift survey. And I'll show you an example of that, but it's our way of not only gathering data about our human interactions and what we're doing on the beach, but also a way to improve the program and help us out with um, shorebird monitoring in the state. So um, signing up where some stewards may remember if you are a returning steward, we used to use Sign Up Genius. This year we are using a different platform. So it's gonna look a little bit different, but um, on our website, you'll see different um, sites listed out. Um, where you can steward and you'll click on the link and it'll take you to each individual sign up page. So um, this example is Huntington Beach State Park. It has the times listed out here on the right hand side that you can sign up for shifts. Uh, when you sign up, you'll need your first name, last name, email, your phone number, and then your zip code of where you live. 
um, just for us to be able to track um, where our volunteers are coming from and then to be able to contact you in case of any emergency or change in the weather, um, things like that, because we want you to be safe. Um, and then I'll give you the address of the location. And then as you scroll down, you'll see more details about each site on the left-hand side. So, and then I've also linked out this training video again, in case you end up at the sign-up site before you watch this video. Our liability forms are linked out at the bottom, different parking information, um, a list of what to remember to bring in case you forget anything. And then once you have picked your sign up times here on the right, when you scroll down, you'll see a little button that says sign up and that'll sign you up for the shifts. And signing up is extremely important because some of our sites require transportation from the parking lot to the nesting site. So by signing up, it alerts our different site leaders that you will be coming and that they need to provide you with transportation. So please, please, please remember to sign up. That way they get that alert. If something comes up and you need to cancel, feel free to either let myself know um, or let the site leader know. Um, you can email me, you'll have my email um, once you sign up. And so we'll move on to what to do after your shift. So you can either keep track of this stuff while you're on the beach, keep it in your head, on your phone, or you can pull up this survey on your phone while you're on the beach. Um, whatever your heart desires. But following your stewarding shift, you're gonna be filling out a little survey that includes your first name, your last name, uh, zip code again, email, again, for contact information. And then you're gonna go through, fill out the date of your shift, what time your shift was, where you worked. Um, if you brought anyone with you, there's a question about how many stewards worked with you. That way we can remember, or we can know if you brought like a family member or a friend that helped you out that day. Um, the estimated total number of people that you saw on the beach during your shift, and then how many people did you talk to during your shift. Um, that way we can keep track of where sites might be seeing more people, where we might need to add more stewards in the future, things like that. Um, and then it asks you how many leashed dogs did you see, how many unleashed dogs. This is important to know because dogs are such a big disturbance to the birds. And especially at sites that don't allow dogs. If you're seeing so many dogs, we may need to do more to educate people um, that will include signage, things like that in the future about not having dogs on the beach. Uh, and then finally, there's a list of birds that you might've seen during your shift. If you don't feel comfortable with I identifying any of these birds, um, this part is totally optional. But if you do feel comfortable, uh, we do like to know what birds people are seeing out on the beach at different times. And then the last little part, also optional, um, add any comments on your shift. Uh, what went well, what, what went bad, if something went bad, uh, what can be improved upon, things like that. Um, and that comes straight to me. And at the end of the season, we do compile all that data and we share it out and that helps us improve the program. And so something optional that we have going on this year is a st shorebird steward certification. And so you do the $20 donation to our coastal program and that helps us improve our work and be able to um, reward our volunteers a little bit more. And so what that is, is one-time $20 donation, uh, you'll take a little 10 question quiz that'll go over some of the questions that come from information from this training. And then I will mail you your certificate. And this is a great, especially for younger folks, this is great to have on hand um, for your resume, for your college, um, high school, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, if you're a young professional, it can help you um, with improving your education within your profession um, because you do learn a lot from this training, hopefully. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so that's that's an optional thing. You don't have to do it to be a shorebird steward. It's just something we wanted to offer uh, folks that wanted to either show off that they were trained as a shorebird steward and now have all this great knowledge um, or improve their resume or professional development in any sort of way. And then next, a little bit different this year, we're gonna be doing some incentives. So nothing big and fancy. We're not giving away TVs or you know, video games, anything like that. Just some, some small things that help us show how appreciative Audubon is of the work that you're doing. 
Audubon, as well as all of our other Shorebird partners, we're all super appreciative of the time you put into this. Um, so it does go by tiers. So tier one, ooh, jumped ahead of slide. Tier one is gonna be for volunteers who serve two shifts. They will earn their choice of sticker. And I've put all of the different stickers that we have here on the screen. And of course I had to throw in the puns. You pelican make a difference. Um, so that's tier one. Tier two, volunteers who serve three shifts will get a little Audubon koozie and then an Audubon pin. So a little Protect Coasts pin that you can put on your backpack or your shirt or your vest, um, whatever you'd like. And uh, this pun is thank you for piping up for shorebirds and that's a little piping plover. Tier three, moving on up. So volunteers who, who serve four ships will get a shorebird steward eagle band and a reusable straw. So the eagle band is this little guy. Um, it's about the size of the bands that one would put on a bald eagle. But it says Audubon, South Carolina shorebird steward. I've seen folks put it on their hats, on the back of their hats, on their backpacks. I use it as a little fidget spinner sometimes. I just play with it. Um, but pretty cool. And then a reusable aluminum straw. And then this one is you seem to be catching the stewarding fever and it's a little American oyster catcher. Tier four volunteers who are becoming pros at this point. So those who have worked six shifts will earn a family pass to Bidler Forest. So that gets you and your up to four people family in for free at our Audubon South Carolina's Bidler Forest Sanctuary. Um, beautiful little sanctuary, lots of, of really cool things to see, a lot of swamp, cypress, tupelo trees. Um, so you will get a free pass to that. Uh, you will be turning the minds of beachgoers all throughout the low country, and that is a least turn. And finally, the last tier, um, volunteers who serve at least eight shifts will earn a reciprocal pass. And so I will put all of the businesses that accept the reciprocal pass here in Charleston. Um, it is based in Charleston. So unfortunately, if you live outside of Charleston, it is a little bit of a travel to get here, but it's very worth it. Saves you, um, depending on how much you use, it can save you hundreds of dollars. Uh, but it gets you into all the plantations, all the museums, uh, the aquarium, all the national historical sites. So it'll get you into Congaree, It'll get you into Fort Sumter, um, all for free, you and a plus one. So it gets in two people for free, essentially. Um, but yeah, that's that's for our pro volunteers. At that point, you'll get a reciprocal pass because we could not be successful without you. And that is a red knot. And then finally, uh, we have shift report monthly drawing. So to encourage folks to remember to submit that post shift survey that we talked about, um, I wanted to do a little raffle each month starting in April. So that's when our shifts start. Each time you submit a post shift report, your name will be entered into a monthly drawing to win different prizes. So we have framed photos from my coworker, uh, Nolan. You can pick one of his photos, we'll frame it for you. Um, that's gonna be one of our prizes. We have several different other framed photos that are already printed that you can choose from. Um, so different things like that. I have a couple books that I'm able to give away and you will be notified if you win and we'll announce it on our social media so you can feel a little bit famous for a minute. Um, but that's just a way to encourage folks to submit this uh, really important data for us at the end of their shifts. A couple more opportunities I wanted to plug uh, before we finish up this training. We are looking for holiday stewards. So folks that may either be just in Charleston for the holiday or who may not wanna to commit to serving shifts the entire summer. Um, we do have a very shortened training that I'll give to holiday stewards, but we will need you folks um, on Memorial Day, July 4th and possibly Labor Day if our birds are still nesting at that time. Just because we see so many more people on the beach, we do want to prioritize those days for stewardship. And then we do need some help with our educational programming. So helping us reach different public schools, private schools, um, kids camps to teach them about shorebirds and seabirds. We have a uh, presentation that's already made. Um, and so I'm open to working with folks who want to help with that, who may have experience with that, or who may be interested in working with younger folks. Um, 
ideally middle school, elementary school, but also we are very interested in working with high school age kids um, and even young college folks. So open to a wide range of educational opportunities. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, that's something you can do. Shorebird monitors. So maybe folks that you know who may not be interested in talking to people on the beach so much, um, they can help us with monitoring the birds and collecting data at our different stewardship sites. Um, horseshoe crab monitors. So folks who see evidence of horseshoe crab nests um, can report those nests to us. So we can report it to DNR to kind of get a better idea of how our horseshoe crabs are doing in the state. And then we have um, some policy advocacy work. So if you want to get involved in that, they do have different um, trainings. So these may be dates that are, are passed depending on when you're watching this training, but they will train you on how to be a, an advocate for shorebirds in the policy realm. And then uh, finally, we always need uh, volunteers for our Byler Forest Sanctuary. So those are some other opportunities on how to get involved with Audubon South Carolina. If you're interested in that at all, uh, feel free to email me. Um, you'll find my email on the website. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you again for watching this presentation. And now it's time to get out there and educate. And with that, welcome to the flock, everyone. We are happy to have you. And I look forward to meeting you all on the beach this year. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>